Chapter three of the text will be regarding doing business in global markets. Uh, it'll be interesting how you as a student can connect what you're learning in this third chapter to all of the different news and um, supply chain issues that have been going on over the last few years um, because of the pandemic and having delays because, you know, the China, a lot of our manufacturing goes on in China and that's where the pandemic initially started. So it had a snowball effect. Um, first, it wasn't able to produce goods and ship them out, but then also um, as they start to recover how business began to boom again and, you know, things started coming back into different countries, but at such a high rate, um, you're now starting to hear how companies have so many products, they don't have enough room on the shelves because people aren't buying them, buying all the different um, products in the mass quantities that they were during the pandemic. So it'll be interesting to see um, just you as a student, how you might be able to connect this chapter with everything that's been going on in the world. The learning objectives for Chapter 3 are to discuss the importance of the global market and the roles of comparative advantage and absolute advantage in the global trade. Learning Objective 2 is to explain the importance of import and export and understanding the key terms used in global business. Number three is to illustrate the strategy, strategies used in reaching global markets and explain the role of a multinational corporation. Learning objective four, evaluate the forces that affect trading in global market. Number five is to, to debate the advantages and disadvantages of trade protectionism. And finally, uh, a Learning objective number six is to discuss the changing landscape of the global market and the issues of out offshore outsourcing. Just a quick bit of trivia to get this chapter going. So let's play Name That Company. The world's largest athletic gear maker decided to close its footwear factories in Ansbach, Germany, and suburban Atlanta, Georgia, and moved to a high-tech speed factory in Vietnam where they will invest in an automated production technology for footwear. Can you name which footwear or athletic gear made this change? If you guessed Adidas, you are correct. Most companies doing business globally believe it's important for the employees to have experience working in other countries. The reason is because the United States is a market of over 320 million people. There are over 7.7 .7 billion potential customers in the 195 countries that up our global market. That's way too many to ignore for a business. Today, the US consumer buys hundreds of billions of dollars worth of goods from Canada, Mexico, and China. Because the global market is so large, it's important to understand the language used for global trade. Importing is the buying of products from another country. Exporting is selling products to another country. The United States is the largest importing nation in the world and is, and is the second largest exporting nation behind China. So as we go through the chapter, it will familiarize you with global business and all the challenges that come along with it. Before we get into all the details of business in the global market, let's first put in context the population of the world by continent. So on the slide, um, all the different continents are highlighted in different colors. Um, the biggest continent comes in in Asia where there is 59.64% of the world's population lives. Comparatively, if we look over in North America, um, that's 4.7% of the population, population lives in North America. So we're talking about the United States, Canada, Mexico, Greenland, Jamaica, Cuba, and many of the Caribbean islands. 
Now, as a North American business, in order to grow your business, the, the logical thing to do is expand, you know, around the world to be able to reach that 59.64% of the population, whether it's Asia's population, Africa, um, South America, or the Oceanic. Uh, so, you know, the logical decision would be more business, more sales equals more revenue, that equals more net profit, at least, you know, theoretically speaking. So th this is why businesses tend to globalize, whether it's for research purposes, to develop new drugs, or to sell cars, you're just getting a, a wider return um, when you're investing in other countries to sell products. Let's take a look at the growth of the world's population on this slide. The world population is expected to grow from 2020 at about 7.8 billion to 9.28 billion by the year 2050. That's about 75 million more people a year and 1.5 billion more than our current population. How will this growth affect the world? Think about it. You know, we'll have more pollution, we'll have more people, which results in more demand for products and services. What are your thoughts? How do you think this population growth is gonna affect the world? When countries are looking to expand globally, they're wanna, gonna wanna do research find out where the countries are in the best position to provide the best return on their investment, whether it's just selling goods in that area or the, the continent or manufacturing goods in those areas. So um, the list on the, on the slide is Forbes' ranking that determined business by climate, by red tape, which is uh, red tape is another term for how hard it is to get a business running and to operate. Corruption. Um, will corruption or law-breaking citizens cause disruption to the business? Property rights and innovation. So they looked at 150 nations and out of them, the US came in number 17 as the best country for business to where the United Kingdom is ranked number one. So just interesting um, on how they are ranked and um, the different things that determine whether it's a, a good fit to do business in. Another interesting bit of information on this list that has all the countries with the amount of billionaires. The United States has the most billionaires in the world. So let's think about this. Why does the United States have more billionaires than any other country? Well, one could be we have a larger population than some of the smaller countries on the slide. So it would make sense that we have more billionaires than those countries. However, some of the countries listed have larger populations than the United States, like India and China. In the US, there's less regulation on business, wages, salaries, are much higher. Um, but you can also think of countries that have communism or controlled um, by the state where people don't have that luxury of making that kind of money without the state coming in and intervening in that process. Why do we trade with other nations? This is simply because no nation, not even technologically advanced ones like the U.S., can produce all the products its people want and need. Even if a country did become self-sufficient, other nations would seek to trade with it in order to meet the needs of their own people. Global trade enables a nation to produce what it is most capable of producing and buy what it needs from others in a mutually beneficial exchange. This happens through the process called free trade. 
Free trade is the movement of goods and services among nations without any political or economic barriers. It's important to note there's pros and cons with any kind of fair trade. The pros are the global market contains 7.7 .7 billion customers that we can sell to. Productivity grows when countries produce goods and services in which they have that comparative advantage. Global competition is less costly. Free trade inspires innovation with new products and keeps that competitive challenge between companies. And then lastly, there's an uninterrupted flow of capital that gives countries access to those foreign investments, keeping interest rates low. Cons, domestic workers can lose their jobs because they, they take the work outside of a country. Workers may be forced to accept pay cuts from their employers when they move some of their work outside of the country just because sometimes people are desperate to keep their jobs. Moving operations overseas can cause intense competition, which means again, loss of jobs um, and more growing number of white collar jobs. And lastly, domestic companies can lose their comparative advantage with competitors because when shipping uh, work outside of the home country can often um, leave a lot of people without a job, which makes it easier to recruit people at lower wages within that country. David Ricardo expanded on Adam Smith's theory of absolute advantage with the theory of comparative advantage. This theory can be difficult to grasp. A country should produce only what it can produce efficiently, buying what it cannot produce as efficiently. This theory of international trade, along with Adam Smith's theory of absolute advantage, has been guiding tenet of international trade since the 1700s. This slide shows how the U.S. is indebted to other countries. Uh, as the world's largest debtor nation, the U.S. relies on other countries to purchase their debt as an investment. Um, but think about how being indebted to other countries can affect the population. There's a pretty interesting article on investopedia.com the title of it is What the National Debt Means to You. Uh, there's five different items to consider, but I think um, as the article notes that the fifth one is the most important. Uh, as the risk of a country defaulting on its debt service obligation increases, the country loses its social, economic, and political power, um, which makes this a, a big issue for the U.S. The national debt level is one of the most important public policies. When debt is used appropriately, it can be used to foster long-term growth and there's prosperity in the country. It must be evaluated in an appropriate manner, comparing the amount of interest expense paid to those governmental expenditures or by comparing debt levels on a per capita basis. So keep that in mind, um, as long as we use uh, that national debt appropriately, we can grow and prosper, but when it's being abused and being spent on unnecessary spending, then that's when it causes problems. Getting involved in global trade is simple, but it's not. <laughs> in simple terms, really, you're just taking a product that is already only offered in one country and offering it in another, and which is called importing. For the CEO, Starbucks, Howard Schultz, found his opportunity to import in Italy. He basically transformed a coffee shop in Seattle to mimic the European cafes. For some businesses, getting involved with global trade is easier because there may be less competition abroad. Exporting goods and services outside of the U.S. results in about 7,000 jobs in the U.S. and also represents about 12% of the U.S. GDP. The Trade Stats Express website listed on the slide is presented by the U.S. Commerce Department 
and it takes a look at any number of statistics on supporting. One example that might surprise you on this website is that snow pl plows and blowers have been sold in Middle Eastern countries like Saudi Arabia. Sounds weird because who would think they would get snow? But it can also be used to clear sand from people's driveways. So it serves you know, a different purpose in a different region, but still can be sold to provide additional revenue to companies. In order to stay competitive, companies are looking for marketing effectiveness through social media. What constitutes a person to be an influencer? It's the amount of people following that person. You can see this on social media with influencers like Kylie Jenner, who has 358 million followers, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, 327 million followers, or even Katy Perry, who has over 165 million followers. One of the things that I've noticed lately is there's a lot of famous people or influencers whose follower or whose partners are becoming influencers. So if you're familiar with country music, you have to know who Luke Bryan is. I've noticed lately on Facebook and Instagram where his wife is actually using her popularity that's happened through her husband's fame to work with a company called Jockey International, selling her own line of products. So this is just one example of how influencers have helped companies stay competitive in the global market. In order to measure global trade, nations have to rely on two indicators, the balance of trade and the balance of payment. And the balance of trade, it's the total value of a nation's exports compared to its imports. A favorable trade balance is trade surplus. It occurs when the value of the country's exports exceed its imports. An unfavorable favorable balance of trade is trade deficit, and that occurs when the country's exports are less than the imports. Continuing on with measuring global trade, let's talk about the balance of payments. The balance of payments is the difference between money coming into a country and money leaving the country, plus money flows coming into or leaving the country from other factors like tourism or foreign aid, military, and foreign investment. Ultimately, the goal is to have more money flowing into the country than out. So that would be your favorable um, result. The unfavorable balance would be payments that exist when more money is flowing out of the country than coming in. Currently, the United States exports more goods and services than it's imported. Today, the United States runs its highest trade deficit with China. Regardless of this, the U.S. still remains one of the most largest exporting nations even through ex exports of lower percentage of its products than other countries. In the support of free trade, the U.S., like other nations, want to make sure that global trade is conducted fairly. To ensure a level playing field, countries prohibit unfair trade practices such as dumping. Dumping is the selling of products in a foreign country at a lower price than those charged in the country that produces the products. Let's review. One major argument favoring the expansion of the U.S. business is that the sheer size of the global market, which is 7.7 .7 billion people, is too large to ignore. Plus, it's difficult for an economy, even one of the largest ones like the U.S. economy, to produce all the goods and services that citizens require or desire. Comparative advantage theory was proposed by David Ricardo and simply states that a country should sell to other countries those products it produces more effectively and efficiently and buy from the other countries the products it cannot produce as effectively and efficiently. An example would be the U.S. producing goods and services such as software and engineering services and buying goods like coffee and shoes from other nations. We can see this process, the comparative advantage theory, all the way back to the, I mean, even the, the 
pioneer days and as it um, as people evolved through time, um, a, a good example would be where um, England buys their tea from China because that's where it was originally produced and discovered. So they had the ability to produce this rather quickly because they already had the crops and it became just kind of a luxury in England and a, an actual staple of people's homes. So since China did this so well, they imported tea from China. The balance of trade is the difference of the total value of a nation's export compared to its import. The balance of payments is the difference between money coming into a country from exports and money leaving the country for imports plus money flows coming into or leaving a country from other factors like tourism, foreign aid, military expenditures, and foreign investment. When senior management elects to expand internationally, they have a wide range of options available to them. As shown on the slide, the range of options can risk from low to high risk. Low risk options are licensing to where high risk option would be foreign direct investment. We will talk more about these risks in the subsequent slides. As we discussed on the last slide, strategies that can be used to reach the global market is licensing, which is one of the lower risk strategies. With licensing, a firm may decide to compete in a global market by licensing the right to manufacture its product or use a trademark to a foreign company for a fee, or they also call this a royalty. Ways that companies can generate revenues by using licensing as an investment into the global market, um, a good example is Coca-Cola. They've entered into licensing agreements with over 225 different licenses. And these have extended into long-term service contracts that sell over 1.9 billion of the company's product each year. Examples of this would be uh, the agreement with McDonald's offering Coca-Cola products. It's used as a marketing tool to attract customers that like Coca-Cola. Um, if you're local to the area, you could also see this with Frisch's, where they also offer Coca-Cola products. So the end results are companies like McDonald's and Frisch's, when they market their products, they also pull in the Coca-Cola products. Uh, so in, in the end, they're gonna end up with more business, um, but then also Coca-Cola also benefits because they're producing more product, they sell it and they profit from it um, because of companies like McDonald's and other places that end up with more business because of their products. To meet increasing global competition, the U.S. Department of Commerce created Export Assistance Centers, or EACs. EACs provide hands-on exporting assistance and trade finance to support small and medium-sized businesses that wish to directly export goods and services. U.S. firms that still hesitate can engage in indirect exporting through specialists called Export Trading Companies, or ETCs. ETCs help companies with direct exporting by negotiating and establishing trading relationships. Franchise is another way that you can get into the global market. Franchising is a contractual agreement whereby someone with a good idea for a business sells others the right to use the business name and sell products or services in a given territory in a specified manner. Franchising is popular both domestically and globally. Some examples of franchises within the United States are McDonald's, which you can see a picture of one in a foreign country. Um, Starbucks is another great one. Um, we've got Domino's Pizza and the list goes on. Um, one of the things that McDonald's has done to be careful when franchising in other countries is to realize that their normal menu here in the U.S. 
doesn't fit uh, all other cultures. So that way, in order for them to really market their product, they have to take into consideration the customs and the dietary restrictions. Um, so that's that's one of the ways that they do this. And we'll talk a little bit more about other offerings in countries outside of the US in the next slide. McDonald's is a leader in franchising and the company operates in 117 different countries. This slide gives you a little insight into how the menu changes in McDonald's depending on what country they're operating in. So my favorite one is Japan. As you know, um, we might call a burger a double cheeseburger here in the US to where they have a different um, name for it, which I'm going to butcher this, but it's teratama, it, which is a teriyaki burger topped with egg, which does sound delicious. So I would love to have that option on our menu, but not even just in Japan. If you look in other areas within the US, um, for instance, in Hawaii, when you go to Hawaii, you'll notice that their menu changes because they're they're um, culturally they like different things. So one of the things I noticed that they offer on their menu in Hawaii was they offer rice. Um, there's a big Asian population over in Hawaii, but they also offer spam, which is a canned ham that is very popular over in Hawaii. Um, they off also offer what is called hapia or coconut pudding or um, taro pies instead of fried apple pies. So even here in the US, we do experience those differences on their franchises just to make sure that when they do open in different regions in the US, they are um, very specific to the needs and wants of their customers in order to make it a successful franchise. Now we are reaching some more riskier approaches to reaching global markets. So we'll talk about global um, contract manufacturing. And as you can see on the illustration below where contract manufacturing is slowly moving towards that most riskiest investment. In contract manufacturing, a foreign company produces private label goods to which a domestic company then attaches to its own brand or trademark. Foxconn is the world's largest contract manufacturer and makes well-known products like iPhones and Microsoft Xbox. Contract manufacturing enables a company to experiment in a new market without incurring heavy startup costs, such as building a plant. A firm can also contract manufacturing tempor temporarily to meet unexpected increases in orders and, of course, labor costs are often low. Contract manufacturing falls under the broad category of outsourcing, which we'll discuss in later chapters. Something to keep in mind is worldwide contract manufacturing is estimated to be an almost $300 billion industry. Another way to invest and reach the global markets is doing international joint ventures and developing strategic alliances. A joint venture is a partnership in which two or more companies join to undertake a major project. Joint ventures are often mandated by governments such as China as a condition of doing business in the country. Joint ventures are developed for many reasons for instance, the Marriott International and AC Hotels in Spain entered into a joint venture to create AC Hotels by Marriott to increase their global footprint and future growth. Joint ventures can also be truly unique. So another example would be a joint venture with a company called Verb Surgical that involves pharmaceutical giants like Johnson & Johnson and Alphabet to develop robotic surgery technology. There's also drawbacks of joint ventures, which we'll talk about more in the next slide. Joint ventures can have many benefits. 
but it's important to also realize there's potential drawbacks. So we talked about the benefits in the last slide. Let's focus more on the drawbacks. One is there's always potential that technology can be stolen or can become obsolete. Sometimes becoming too large to be flexible. And then lastly, one partner might break its ties that could potentially cause problems with the long-term livelihood of a company internationally. Thanks to their flexibility, strategic alliances can effectively link firms from different countries and firms of vastly different sizes. So essentially, a strategic alliance is a long-term partnership between two or more companies to help each other build competitive market advantages. They don't typically share costs, risk, or management, or even profits. Strategic alliances provide access to markets, capital, and a tech technical expertise. And finally, let's talk about the riskiest way of reaching the global market. This is done by doing a foreign direct investment or an FDI, which is buying a permanent property or business in a foreign nation. The most common form of FDI is a foreign subsidiary, a company owned in a foreign country by another company called the parent company. The subsidiary must observe legal requirements of both the country where the parent firm is located or the home country and the foreign country where the subsidiary is located, which is called the host country. The primary advantage of subsidiaries is that a company maintains complete control over technology or expertise it may possess. The major shortcoming is the need to commit funds and technology with foreign boundaries. Should relationships with a host country falter, the firm's assets could be expropriated, which really means just taking over by the government. An example of a foreign direct investment would be with companies like Volkswagen that invests in a plan outside of Germany to produce and sell their goods in the US. Although this is a com company from a foreign country, if the car is produced in the US, does this make the product a US made or a German car? One could argue that since American people are working at a plant, it's considered an American car. However, you could also argue that the technology is developed in Germany, meaning it's a German car, and that profits are going back to Germany. So there's a lot of different sides that one could argue, but what would be the, the technical answer here? On this slide, you can see different models of cars, where they're manufactured, and the percentage of parts that are American. Not all American cars are American, and not all foreign cars are foreign. You might be surprised to find out, in addition to not using mostly American parts, the Ford Fusion is also partly assembled in Mexico. Multinational corporations are one that manufactures and markets products in many different countries and has multinational stock ownership and management. Not all large global businesses are considered to be multinational. For example, a corporation could export everything it produces, deriving 100% of its sales and profits globally and still not be a multinational corporation. Only firms that have manufacturing capacity or some other physical presence in different nations can truly be called multinational. As we talked on previous slides about entering the global market and how different countries rate differently as far as global exports and imports, um, the United States is still at the top on one of the largest multinational corporations and in the world with Walmart coming in first at $500 billion uh, with the originating country of United States. Um, soon close to follow is China with the, the top second through fourth, um, ranging from anywhere from 326 billion to 349. At the bottom, we also show Exxon and Berkshire being on the list as well from the United States with around $240 billion worth of revenue also uh, originating 
and the United States. A growing form of foreign direct investment is the use of sovereign wealth funds, or SWFs. Investment funds controlled by government holding investment stakes in foreign companies. Sovereign wealth funds from the United Arab Emirates, Singapore, and China have purchased interest in many U.S. companies. The size of SWFs are seven trillion globally, and government ownership may, had some fear that they might be used for achieving geopolitical objectives by gaining control of strategic natural resources or obtaining sensitive technology. So far, this has not been a problem. Um, and actually, during the Great Recession in 2008, the sovereign wealth funds injected billions of dollars into struggling U.S. companies such as Citigroup and Morgan Stanley. Entering global business requires selecting an entry strategy that fits your business goals. So as you can imagine, it's really important to really analyze what fits and what doesn't. The different strategies we've discussed reflect different levels of ownership, financial commitment, and risk. Although this isn't everything, you should also be aware of the forces that affect a business's ability to thrive in other markets. Let's review. The key advantages of using licensing as a method of entry into global markets are a firm can often gain avenue, revenues in a market it would not have generated in its home market. Also, Licensees must purchase startup supplies and consulting services from a licensing firm, and licensors spend little or no money to produce and market their products. Disadvantages to licenses include, A, if a product is extremely successful in another market, the licensor does not receive the bulk of the revenues, and B, if the foreign licensee learns the company's technology and product secrets, it may break the agreement and begin producing similar products on its own. Big risk there. Export trading companies provide such services as assistance in associating and establishing the desired trading relationships, matching buyers and sellers from different countries, and help dealing with foreign customs offices, documentation, and weights and measures. A joint venture is a partnership between two or more country, companies whereby they undertake a major project. Joint ventures generally involve sharing technology and risk, sharing marketing and management expertise, entry into markets where foreign companies are often not allowed unless goods are produced locally, and a strategic alliance partners do not share cost, risk, management, or even profits. The purpose is to gain advantages in building competitive market advantages. And finally, a multinational corporation manufactures and markets products in many different countries and has multinational stock ownership and management. Only firms that have manufacturing capacity or other physical presence in the countries can be called multinational. Some of the forces that are affecting trading in global markets are the socio-cultural forces. What makes operating an international environment more complex than operating only in domestic market is an addition of new uncontrollable forces, again known as socio-cultural forces. A lack of cultural understanding can create problems when working with the international market. Even the color or type of flower can have a different meaning. One book that provides numerous examples to share is called Kiss, Bow, or Shake Hands, How to Do Business in 60 Countries. Never assume what works in your country will work in every country. Understanding social culture differences is also important in managing employees. A global marketing strategy can be very difficult to implement. Look at the problems that well-known companies encountered in global markets on this slide. There are several examples on the slide, but I think the best example, at least one that I can really connect to, is the 
Kentucky Fried Chicken, or known as KFC. Their patented slogan was finger licking good. Sounds great if you're an American, but when you see this, this patent in Japanese, they thought that finger licking good meant bite your fingers off. As you might realize, this misinterpretation of the slogan could lead to a company sinking or swimming in Japan or other countries for that matter. So it's very important to ensure that you have experts, whether it's people or company that specialize in how these cultural differences influence a company's success in, in one country and around the world. I work at a company that has a global presence. Personally, there is nothing more exciting to me than move, having the option to travel outside of the US to a foreign country and experiencing the cultural differences, understanding their outlook on their country versus the US and explaining those differences if I can. Some very fascinating cultural and social differences exist in other nations like in Japan. A smile can mean that a person is uncomfortable or sad. If you're traveling to Sweden, make sure you're making appointments two weeks in advance. Uh, in Brazil, the lack of punctuality is a fact of life, so be accustomed to waiting. So I guess some of the helpful hints that if you're going to be dealing with people globally is be savvy of the cultures in other countries. Learn about language, dress code, culture and recognize the importance of dealing with cultural differences and the consequences of taking no action um, with your businesses. Manage and learn and appreciate various cultures and build a database of information about each country where you um, have business relationships. Um, one of the things that my company has done is, uh, it's been a while ago, but in the past for each country that we worked in, um, they would create fact sheets so people would understand the ins and outs of the cultures of that country, whether it be um, how to address people, uh, key words um, like saying hello, and um, also the different kinds of currency that might be offered in those countries. This slide is a classic example of understanding culture of another country. So as it says, do as Germans do so you don't embarrass yourself when you visit the country. I wish I had this slide when I visited Germany about, I think it was about seven years ago for business. Um, always use titles like Dr. Fra or Her. Always provide food and drinks for your birthday, which I think we are pretty accustomed to this at the US side. So that's one thing that we don't, we don't mess up on. Don't remove your jacket until your host does. Wear conservative business attire. Everything else is considered sloppy. You don't jaywalk, which I was a little guilty of when I was in Germany. And always keep your hands on the table when eating, which is kind of the opposite of how I grew up, is don't leave your hands on the table. So, interesting. Another force that affects trading in the global market is economic and financial forces, and specifically is the exchange rates, which is the value of one nation's currency relative to the currencies of other countries. The floating exchange rate system creates transaction risk. If the US dollar is trading for more foreign currency, it's said to be getting stronger. When the US dollar is trading for less foreign currency, it is said to be getting weaker. Since the breakdown of the Bretton Woods Agreement in 1971, the value of the US currency has generally trended downward versus major world currencies. So in my experience, um, since I've worked for a global company since 2010, so that's for 12 years, um, the US dollar has traded um, weaker. And I think when I started with my company, it was trading, um, the euro was trading for the US dollar at $1.50. So um, if you were coming from a country that used the euro, say for instance, Germany, 
when they came to the U.S., their dollar, their their Germany currency um, that equaled a dollar would be worth a dollar fifty in the U.S. Now we're seeing where Germany with the euro is coming more in line. So instead of trading at a dollar fifty when they come to the U.S., now it's right at a dollar. So we're not, you know, really losing anything in the exchange. What will be interesting to see in the coming months is if the dollar really, really gets stronger to where it's trading for more globally than it is at home. Um, once we start seeing that, we'll see more U.S. companies investing in other countries like um, within the European Union and Germany and um, Spain or Italy interesting information for sure. Keeping in mind our previous slide on currency and exchange rate, do you think that U.S. exporters profit more when the dollar is up or when it is down? A weak dollar means that imports are more expensive, but conversely, exports are more attractive to buyers outside the U.S. So for businesses that import, components or products in another currency, their costs will increase. Moving on regarding the forces affecting trade in global markets, let's talk more about currency valuation. Currency valuation problems can be especially harsh on developing economies. At time, a nation's government will intervene and readjust the value of currency often to increase the export potential of its products. Devaluation lowers the value of the nation's currency relative to others. As an example, Venezuela devalued its currency in 2014 to try and alleviate mounting economic issues. Unfortunately, the move did little to solve the country's problems. Inflation in Venezuela, in Venezuela hit 1.37 million percent in 2018. Counter trading is a complex form of bartering in which several countries each trade goods or services for other goods and services. So let's think about a developing country such as Jamaica wants to buy vehicles from Ford in exchange for bauxite, a mineral compound that is a source for aluminum oil. Ford does not need Jamaican bauxite, but it does need compressors. In a counter trade, Ford may trade vehicles to Jamaica, which trades bauxites to another country like India, which exchanges compressors with Ford. It's estimated that counter trading accounts for over 20% of all global exchanges, especially in developing countries. One famous example of counter trading involved Pepsi and Russian vodka. Pepsi received the right to market Russian vodka in the United States as payment for Pepsi sold in Russia. From a legal and regulatory forces, there are no global system of laws. This makes conducting global business difficult as business people navigate a sea of laws and regulations that are often inconsistent. Antitrust rules, labor relations, patent copyrights, trade practices, taxes, product liability, child labor, and the list goes on is different in every country. U.S. businesses must follow U.S. laws and regulation in conducting businesses globally. Although legislation such as the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act of 1978 can create competitive disadvantages. This law prohibits questionable or dubious payments to foreign officials to secure business contracts. In other countries, sometimes where corporate or government bribery is not merely acceptable, but perhaps it's the only way to secure business. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, and Transparency International have led to a global effort to fight corruption and bribery in global businesses, but with limited success. This slide shows the list of the top countries that has the most corrupt business practices. 
The cooperation and sponsorship of local business people in a foreign market can help a company penetrate the market and deal with laws, regulations, and bureaucratic barriers in their country. Physical and environmental forces certainly affect a company's ability to conduct global business. Some developing countries have such primitive transportation and storage systems that international distribution is ineffective, if not impossible, especially for perishable food. Add unclean water, the lack of, of effective sewer systems, and unacceptable air pollution levels, and you can see the intensity of this problem. Technological differences also influence the features and feasibility of exporting products. An example of technological differences, um, I saw where Teladoc was trying to expand their services uh, in some of the Asian countries. Um, some of the Asian countries that aren't as well developed as others would have problems with um, being able to roll out a service like Teladoc to get medical service to their uh, people in remote villages because they just don't have the infrastructure set up to be able to um, hold the type of infrastructure for internet and for any kind of backup services that would be needed in order to make sure that they could roll out the service. But then on the other side of it is making sure those people in those remote villages actually have access to cell phones to where they could use that kind of service. I mean, some of the alternate ideas for people that might not have cell phones might be a central place, like say maybe a um, government building or a library where they could actually go and use the service. So sometimes as um, the text tells you it's almost impossible to get some services rolled out to other areas. Let's review. Four major hurdles to successful global trade are social, cultural forces, economic and financial forces, legal and regulatory forces, and physical and environmental forces. Ethnocentricity is an attitude that your nation's culture is superior to those of other cultures. It can affect global trade because all nations are proud of their culture culture and do not aspire to be like other countries. Thus, it's easy to offend potential customers by being ethnocentric. A low value of the dollar would make U.S. exports cheaper in foreign markets and may lead to higher demand for U.S. products. The Foreign Corrupt Practices Act prohibits questionable and dubious payments to foreign officials to secure business contracts. Other nations do not have to follow this law, causing some disadvantages for U.S. businesses. What is often a much greater barrier to global trade is trade protectionism. Trade protectionism is the use of government regulations to limit the import of goods and services. Advocates of protectionism believe it allows domestic producers to survive and grow, producing more jobs. Other countries use protectionist measures because they are weary of foreign competition in general. Business, economics, and politics have always been closely linked. Economics was once referred to as political economy, indicating the close ties between politics or government and economics. 
In the 17th and 18th centuries, business people and government leaders endorsed an economic policy called mercantilism. The idea was for the nation to sell more goods to other nations than it brought, bought from them. That is, to have favorable balance of trade. According to the mercantilists, this resulted in a flow of money to the country that sold the most globally. The philosophy led governments to implement tariffs or taxes on imports, making imported goods more expensive to buy. There are two kinds of tariffs, a protective and a revenue. Protective tariffs import taxes that raise the retail price of imported products so that domestic goods are more competitive priced. These tariffs are meant to save jobs for domestic workers and keep industries, especially infant industries, that have companies in the early stages of growth from closing down because of foreign competition. Revenue tariffs are designed to raise money for the government. An import quota limits the number of products in certain categories a nation can import. In the U.S., there is an import quota on a number of products, including sugar and beef, to protect U.S. companies and preserve jobs. The U.S. also prohibits the export of specific products. Anti-terrorism laws and the U.S. Export Administration Act of 1979 prohibited exporting goods such as high-tech weapons that could endanger national security. An embargo is a complete ban on the import or export of a certain product or the stopping of all trade with a particular country. For example, it, the United States imposed an embargo in 2019 against Venezuela. This action placed them on par with other countries that were subject to U.S. embargoes. Some non-tariff barriers are not as specific or formal as tariffs, import quotas, and embargoes, but can be just as detrimental to free trade. For example, India imposes a number of restrictive standards like import licensing, burdensome product testing requirements, and lengthy customs procedures that inhibit the sale of imported products. Exporters might view such trade barriers as a good reason to avoid global trade, but overcoming constraints creates business opportunities. In an effort to protect trade throughout the world, the World Trade Organization was created. In 1948, government leaders from 23 nations formed the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or the GATT a global forum for reducing trade restrictions on goods, services, ideas, and cultural programs. Later, the World Trade Organization was established to mediate trade disputes among nations. The World Trade Organization headquartered in Geneva is an independent entity of 164 member nations whose purpose is to oversee cross-border trade issues and global business practices. Trade disputes are represented by member nations with decisions made within a year rather than languish, languishing on for years. Member nations can appeal decisions. The WTO has not solved all global trade problems. In fact, the WTO has not reached any significant trade accord since the Doho round of negotiations that ended in 2015. Recently, the organization has come under heavy criticism by the United States. Without the WTO's inability to intervene on trade wars, it's possible that the organization could cease to exist in the future. A common market, or also known as a trading bloc, is a regional group of countries with a common external tariff, no internal tariffs, and coordinated laws to facilitate exchange among members. The European Union, Mercosur, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, Economic Community, and the Common Market for Eastern and Southern Africa are common markets. The EU began in the late 1950s as an alliance of six trading partners. 
<clears throat> Today, it is a group of 27 nations with combined population of over 477 million and a GDP of $18.4 trillion. In 1999, the EU took a significant step by adopting one common currency called the Euro. EU businesses save billions by eliminating currency conversions. In 2016, the UK voted to leave the EU. This was known as Brexit. The UK became the first nation to withdraw from the EU when it formally left in 2020. This isn't the first problem the EU has had. Financial difficulties in member nations like Italy, Portugal, Spain, and Greece required formal bailout assistance. Going forward, the EU faces many challenges. Still leading members consider economic integration among member nations as the best strategy to compete globally against major global powers like the US and China. This illustration is meant to show you how the members of the European Union are represented on a map. Current EU members are highlighted all in yellow. Countries that have applied for membership are in orange. To further discuss trade protectionism, let's talk about NAFTA and the US-Mexico-Canada Agreement. NAFTA, or the North American Free Trade Agreement, created a free trade area among the United States, Canada, and Mexico. The agreement was widely controversial and often criticized since the passage. Opponents warned of the loss of U.S. jobs and can capital. Supporters predicted NAFTA would open a vast new market in U.S. exports and create jobs and market opportunities in the long run. The objectives were to first eliminate trade barriers and facilitate cross-border movement of goods and services. Secondly, promote conditions of fair competition. Third, increase investment opportunities. Fourth, provide effective protection and enforcement of intellectual property rights, which include patents and copyrights. Five, establish a framework for further regional trade cooperation. And finally, improve working conditions in North America, particularly in Mexico. NAFTA didn't do so well, so a new agreement called the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement, or USMCA, was formed and ratified in 2020. The goals were to create and level the playing field for U.S. workers with improved rules, modernize and strengthen food and agriculture trade North, in North America, support modern economy, and introduce new rules on digital trade, anti-corruption, and good regulatory practices. Time will tell if USMCA achieves these goals. Another trade agreement that the US used to help with free trade among other nations is called the Central American Free Trade Agreement, or CAFTA. The CAFTA created free trade zone with Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, El Salvador, Guatemala, Nicaragua, and Honduras. There are also other trade agreements that the U.S. has entered into with South Korea, Australia, and other nations. Let's review. <clears throat> Trade protectionism is the use of government regulations to limit the import of goods and services. It can be a barrier to global trade. Trade protectionism often involves the use of tariffs or taxes on imported goods that makes them more expensive to buy. Protective tariffs can be an advantage to workers in certain industries since it makes the products they produce more cost competitive with imported products. American labor unions have sought certain protective tariffs. Revenue tariffs are designed as a source of revenue for the government. Most economists do not favor the use of tar tariffs. Instead, they are in favor of free trade. The World Trade Organization, or the WTO, was established to mediate trade disputes among nations. The purpose of a common market like the EU 
which is the European Union, is to have common external tariffs, no internal tariff, and coordinated laws to facilitate exchange between member nations. This enables smaller nations to compete as a group against large economies like the United States, China, or Japan. Global trade opportunities grow more interesting and challenging every day. After all, 7.7 .7 billion potential customers are attractive. However, terrorism, nuclear proliferation, rogue states, income inequality, trade wars, and other issues cast a dark shadow on global markets. With more than 1.4 billion people and incredible exporting prowess, China has transformed the world economic map. China is the world's largest exporter and the second largest economy. Many view China as free traders dream, where global investment and entrepreneurship will lead to wealth. However, there are concerns about China's one-party political system, human rights abuses, currency issues, increasing urban population growth, trade restrictions, and the aging populations. While China attracts most of the attention in Asia, India's population of over 1.36 billion presents a tremendous opportunity. India has seen strong growth in information technology, biotechnology, and pharmaceutical business is expected to grow 55 billion in 2020. Russia and Brazil were projected to be wealthy global economies by 2025. Unfortunately, Russia's economy slowed when world oil prices declined and the government admitted that growth prospects for its economy were not as strong as the previous two decades. To make it more complicated, Russia is plagued by political currency and social problems as considered by Transparency International as the world's most corrupt major economy. Brazil is the largest economy in South America and the seventh largest economy in the world with well-developed agriculture, mining, manufacturing, and service sectors. Along with Russia, Brazil was expected to dominate the global market as a supplier of raw materials. Unfortunately, over the past few years, Brazil's economy has struggled with widespread political corruption, inflation, and slow growth. Still, its growing consumer market of over 200 million people is a great place for major exporters like the U.S. and China. BRIC, or B-R-I-C, has been an acronym for these countries. However, BRIC nations are not only areas of opportunities. There's many other countries to look at that include Indonesia, Thailand, Singapore, the Philippines, South Korea, Malaysia, and Vietnam. Outsourcing is the process whereby one firm contracts with other companies, often in other countries, to do the same or all of its functions. In the U.S., companies have outsourced payroll functions, accounting, and some manufacturing operations for many years. Some of the problems with growth in these global, global markets where they're shifting to outsourcing are some quality issues. And some of those um, really just come from cultural differences and being able to understand uh, how processes works because of language barriers. It's important to remember when dealing with the global market and using out, offshore outsourcing there are pros and cons, just like with any other new process. The pros are that it's less strategic tasks can be outsourced globally so that companies can focus on areas which they can excel and grow. Outsource work allows companies to create efficiencies that in fact, let them hire more workers. Consumers benefit from lower prices gener generated by effective use of global resources and developing nations grow, fueling the global economic growth. The cons are that jobs might be permanently lost and wages fall due to low cost competition offshore. Offshore outsourcing may reduce product quality and can therefore cause damage to the company's reputation. Communication among company members with suppliers and with customers become much more difficult. 
Regardless of where your career may be headed in the future, everyone must realize that the global market business is here to stay. In order to make sure you have a grasp on how the global market might impact you, anticipate that you may have to work with people of other cultures that speak different languages. Therefore, learn another language other than English. It's important to note in many countries throughout the world, people know more than just one language. Although the most commonly spoken language in the world is English, knowing other languages can help break barriers with your business and help it succeed. As the global market has more countries enter, competition will increase. All businesses, regardless of their size, have the potential to operate within the global market. And finally, let's review. The major threats to doing business in global markets are terrorism, nuclear proliferation, rogue states, and other issues. There are concerns about China's one-party political system, human right abuses, currency issues, and increasing urban population growth. Another challenge is China's underground economy, which creates piracy and counterfeiting. The key concern about offshore outsourcing is the loss of jobs. Today, such loss includes professional services as well as production jobs. Questions also linger about outsourcing sensitive products like airline maintenance, medical devices, potential cures for diseases. Consumers fear about quality and product safety, keeping the issue at center stage. <laughs>